Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Craig Stoudemire, and I'm in a lawyer with the law firm of Nauman Smith Schistler and Hall in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. We'd like to welcome all of you to today's uh, webinar on a guide to election access in 30 minutes. Um, just a couple of housekeeping uh, items before we get jump into the seminar. Um, as you know and just heard, uh, the seminar is being recorded. Um, rest easy though, except for the four panelists that you see highlighted there. Um, the participants' um, videos are not being recorded, just the uh, lecture, so rest easy there. We would ask, it's up to you whether you keep your video <laughs> on or off during the program, it's up to you. We would ask though that you please mute your, um, your uh, connection so that it doesn't interfere with the discussion. Um, also, we welcome questions during today's session, and uh, we will leave some time at the end to ask questions, but if you want to, you can put them into the chat function, and we'll be monitoring those. And then finally, um, everyone who signed up for today's seminar will be receiving by the end of the week um, a copy of the recording along with the uh, PowerPoint, other information that you received today. So you will receive that as, as if you signed up and gave us an email address to get back. So, like once again, if you could just mute your connection for now. Uh, so I hear some background in, in background uh, content there. I'd like to introduce our uh, panel today. Um, today, we were very fortunate to have a, a good variety of people involved in this discussion. It's hard to say that it's not timely, especially on October 3rd, since we're a little over one month away from the election here in Pennsylvania. Um, and you know, when I was I was looking up quotes on, uh, uh, and John F. Kennedy made a quote of saying that the ignorance of one voter in a democracy impairs the security of all. So with those words ringing, I'd like to introduce the rest of the panel. Um, uh, first up is uh, Jim Parsons, who is the uh, news director at WTAE Pittsburgh and a former investigative reporter, and an award-winning investigative reporter in his own right. I've known Jim a long time and he's seen these issues from, from very different perspectives. Also, we have Melissa Molusky from the uh, PNA and the Pennsylvania News Media Association. Melissa is in-house counsel for the PNA and handles hundreds, if not thousands, of inquiries during the course of the year, many of which lately have been on election issues. And then finally, my partner, Josh Bond, who's an attorney here at Nauman Smith, um, who has an interesting uh, hat is doing both right to know work for requesters and also being a municipal solicitor. So he sees things from different angles as well. So with that sort of introduction, we'll get right into it, dealing first with the Pennsylvania's current political climate. Jim? Well, I think we've uh, seen, we're seeing a very interesting um, campaign season for US Senate and for governor. Nothing quite like this that I've seen uh, in the past, uh, especially when it comes to the lack of debates. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, you know, here at WTAE in Pittsburgh, where I'm news director, we've hosted uh, debates for governor and for the US Senate um, until this year. Uh, and, and we worked on uh, I'm trying to get a debate for both. And, um, you know, we're seeing a, a reluctance by, by candidates from major parties to, to, to square off against their, uh, their competitors. Uh, we hadn't seen anything quite like that in the past as much as we've seen it this year. Current polls, you know, just a new poll out today from USA Today and Suffolk University in Boston showing uh, in the US Senate race, showing a six point lead for John Fetterman. The same poll back in June showed, I think it was nine points for Fetterman. So that, that parallels what most of the polls are showing that Oz is, is narrowing the gap with Fetterman in the US Senate. Um, the, the, the Hill poll that came out, I think yesterday and Emerson College showed a two point Fetterman lead. Fox News poll showed a four point Fetterman lead. And then there was last week, there was the Marist poll, which showed, you know, a seven point, seven to 10 point Fetterman lead. So um, those who say you can't trust polls, they're all over the place. They all do still show Fetterman up, but some are within the margin of error. Uh, on the Mastriano uh, Shapiro side, not so close. Uh, most of the polling still showing high negatives for Mastriano. Um, I gotta say, as a, you know, as a news director, for uh, for a television station here in Pittsburgh, there's been you know 
a local broadcast journalist uh, organization for 65 years, I think that when candidates refuse to engage with the mainstream media, they do so at their own risk. And I do believe that that's what's going on with, with Mastriano right now. Um, he is, uh, you know, he's far behind in the polls. He's not engaging with, with, with reporters. He's not taking questions. I think voters are seeing that um, and it's hurting him. I like to believe that anyway. Um, we, uh, when, when Mastriano showed up here in, uh, in our area, Newcastle, about a month ago, to, uh, to speak with his supporters. Uh, Paul Van Osdall, one of our reporters and the photographer, uh, Kendall Cross, went up there to try and engage with him. I mean, they kind of showed the viewers what it was like to get an interview with Doug Mastriano. And uh, it's just very, very difficult. Um, if any here, anybody here uh, on this call is watching Power Trip on Hulu, it is a George Stephanopoulos production with embedded journalists, with candidates and half a dozen different swing states. The latest episode that was on Sunday uh, is mostly about Pennsylvania, and it's mostly about ABC embedded journalist Will McDuffie embedded with Mastriano, and he's been, he was with Mastriano for a month and still had never met the press secretary and was still playing nice with the rules of trying to get an interview with Mastriano and still hadn't had never Mastriano never even shown him the, the time of day. So uh, all of that is very interesting, but but on the you know in the Senate race. Fetterman's doing the same thing. I mean, he did, a, he did an interview this morning with KDK Radio, uh, and he, he answered some tough questions that Marty Griffin and Larry Richard asked him, um, but that's been very rare. And Fe so Fetterman's essentially doing the same thing as Mastriano, not quite such a brick wall with, with Fetterman. And let's be honest, Fetterman has agreed to do a debate on the 25th of October uh, with Dr. Oz. That'll be on the next star stations and also WPXI here in Pittsburgh. Um, I, I just think it's, I think there's a real, real good chance that this backfires on candidates who refuse to engage. If anybody read Charles Thompson's piece this morning in the Patriot News, uh, Penn Live, it's about the, um, the Chamber of Commerce, Pennsylvania Chamber of Commerce event last night in Harrisburg, where uh, Shapiro and Oz were given the stage without their opponents there. And they interviewed Chris Christie, who I think moderated the debate last night. And Christie said he thought it was a mistake for both Oz and Fetterman to not show up last night and to not engage with mainstream media. So I know I'm a little biased when it comes to that, but I, I've just never seen anything quite like this. Well, Jim, you bring up an interesting question about access. And so with that in mind, you know, we, we're gonna look at two elements of access to this afternoon. One is access to information records, if you will. And then later on, we'll talk about access to, you know, polling places, candidates, that type of thing. So with that in mind, I will turn it over to, um, I think it's uh, Melissa, Josh, are you gonna take it from here? Okay. Yes, I'll, I'll take this first slide, Craig. Uh, thanks everybody for uh, signing up for the webinar today. Uh, I'm gonna talk about access to voter records or election records. And I think the, the important point that I wanna get across is that the, the right to know law is not the vehicle that you want to use to access uh, voter or election records. Um, on, if you're not familiar with Pennsylvania's right to know law, any information that is in the possession of a government agency is presumed to be a public record, and you can request that under the right to know law, um, and you're, you will get an answer if you file a right to know request you're, you'll get uh, at least a final response within 35 to 37 days of whenever you file the, the response or the request. And then you may have to, you may have to pursue an appeal um, and it may be two or three years before you actually get the records. Um, with the election code, that should not be an issue because the, the election code uh, expressly designates certain records as public records and provides that the, the, the county or the Department of State has to provide those records for review during, during regular business hours as long as certain uh, conditions are met. And so my advice to any, any reporters that are seeking election records would be please don't file right to no requests. Please try to uh, get 
establish a relationship with your local election officials and with the with uh, the Department of State and try to get these records through the channels that these agencies provide the records. Um, these agencies right now, counties are being overwhelmed with right to know requests from uh, out of state uh, organizations that are challenging the the elections, particularly the 2020 election. Um, so if you're filing a right to know request, you're probably going to get one get lost in the shuffle and two, it's going to be a long time before you get an answer. Uh, to get e uh, election records from the Pennsylvania Department of State, you often have to sign a verification uh, that you're not going to use those records. You're, you're not going to sell the information in the records. That is something that, that journalists do have to agree to and do commonly agree to to get access to these uh, um, records. Uh, the, the slide here, it says personal information not released. Just to clarify that, there's certain information in election records that actually is public and, and does need to be released. For example, the names, home addresses, and date of births of voters are available uh, from the Pennsylvania Department of State for a minimal, a minimal cost. You just need to sign an affidavit that you're not going to sell that information uh, whenever whenever you receive it, but you can use it for news gathering purposes. Um, and so uh, with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna there, there have been some final determinations coming out in recently involving uh, access to certain types of records. One thing that is off limits is uh, contents of ballot boxes or contents of voting machines, uh, that information is not public. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa to discuss uh, specific records that you can try to get under the election code. Thanks, Josh. Um, hi, everybody, nice to see you, be here with you today. But yes, there, as, as Josh said, um, there is information that you would not get under the right to know law that is expressly public under the election code. So when you are making a request, you'll want to, if it's in writing, obviously state this is a request made pursuant to the, to the election code and not the right to know law so that we all know we're on the same page um, with regard to access because the, the levels of access are, are significantly different um, depending on which law you're operating under. So under the election code, um, there are certain records that are accessible for public inspection and copying. Um, during regular business hours. And these include returns, nomination petitions, voter lists, reports, street lists are among the, uh, are among the um, uh, voter registration records and election records that are expressly public and, and um, they are delineated specifically in either the election code itself or in their corresponding regulations. Um, there is a wrinkle and for many of you, I know you have digital, um, components. If you do get the entire voter database download from the Department of State, um, there is a regulation in Pennsylvania that says you may not, it may not be published on the internet. Um, there are a few court cases where that has, has been and is continuing to be litigated. Um, so I just want to mention that, that if you do, I think it's $20 to go to the Department of State and get that voter database, every voter name, address, phone number, date of birth, political party affiliation, voting history, um, that's all public, but you can't put it on your website um, under Pennsylvania's uh, election code regulations. Um, so that voter down that that voter role is available for download, um, but there are some limitations. In addition to the affidavit that you have to sign saying you're not going to sell it, you also the affidavit typically also includes a statement that you affirm you will not publish it on the internet. Um, that comes as a surprise to a lot of the journalists I deal with. But like I said, there are some lawsuits pending on whether or not that is allowed under Pennsylvania law or federal law. Um, there's a First Amendment argument being made in a, in a few cases, both here in Pennsylvania and in other states. Um, like Josh said, the contents of ballot boxes and voting machines are not public. There, there, as Josh mentioned, there are two cases um, from the Office of Open Records decided in the past two days that dealt with identical records 
um, about uh, kind of like the data that underlies the voting records, you know, how many, which uh, sites um, were voted at, you know, um, various information that um, is kind of part and parcel of the election code, but not specifically delineated as a public record. And we have two different opinions from the Office of Open Records. In one case, they found uh, the election code required access. In another case, out of a different county, the election, the Office of Open Records found that there wasn't um, access under the election code, even though we were talking about basically identical election code records. So just know that um, the things that we're talking about today, many of them will be specifically delineated, um, but if they're not specifically delineated as public under the election code, you're going to find yourself um, kind of um, in in a in a in a procedure that is going to require the Office of Open Records or some other tribunal to determine whether or not access is actually permitted under the election code. Um, and it's there's no clear answer in those situations. And, and those two cases that I just talked about or mentioned are a perfect example of why um, of, of records that may be public in some circumstances, but may not be in others. Um, if you bear with well, me. Melissa, just here. to clarify, yeah. just sure. to clarify to make sure. So the election code itself makes provisions for making public certain types of records. And those are the ones that you talked about at the first bullet point there. Correct. Ballots, absentee ballots, completed ballots, the return, um, voter information, like the records of a registration commission and district register, street lists, um, official voter registration applications, petitions and appeals, witness lists, accounts and contracts, and reports, although that's kind of a, uh, an amorphous term. Um, so yes, there are there are many things that are specifically delineated in the election code or regulations as expressly public. And I would imagine that that entails though you must go to the office of the Bureau of Elections for that particular county and request the records that you're looking for. Typically, yes. Although some of those records will also be available from the Department of State. Okay. Yeah, and we talked about the voter, the statewide voter list is available from the Department of State for the twenty twenty five dollars. And correct. And, and those are just those are just the records that are available under the election code. There are also records that will be available about candidates under the state ethics act. So, for example, the statements of financial disclosure that are required of candidates for public office, they are expressly public as well and contain a wealth of information. Those are also available from your county elections office. And in some cases, the Department of State has those for the state level uh, elected officials or, or public officials. Um, those are not election code records, those are state ethics code records, but they are equally expressly public. Okay, and since we've been talking about access to records, let's sort of keep the theme but change the horse a little bit. And that's talking about access to the, the candidates to polling places, that type of thing. Um, so as, as Jim mentioned in his opening remarks, you know, let's talk initially about getting access to campaign events, polls, et cetera. Um, what are the rules, if any, on that? Okay. Well, what? So when we're talking about the the polling places, um, the election code has a provision that says and has been interpreted to allow election officials to exclude anyone who's not a poll watcher, a poll worker, or a voter, um, a ten foot barrier. Um, now that's around the polling place and polling place is a specifically defined term. It is defined as the room in which voting takes place. The issue that I hear about most from journalists is not that they're excluded, not that there's a 10 foot barrier around the room, it's that there's a 10 foot barrier around the building, which is very different. And I think is uh, it, when, when you have local elected offic election officials saying, you know, you don't, you don't get 10 feet to the building, um, that's a misapplication of the limitations that are in the election code itself. The polling place is the room where voting takes place. It is not the entire building. So if you find yourself in a situation where, um, you know, voting's taking place in, uh, like for me, it takes place in a church auxiliary room um, where I vote, uh, there's no one is allowed in there except for people. No one's allowed into the church building itself except for voters and poll workers and poll watchers. 
So I think that's in my situation, there's a misapplication. And I have talked to journalists outside my, my, my polling place um, um, who are just following the rules because they don't want to be excluded completely. It's not worth it. Um, but I do recommend to journalists to have these discussions and have this particular discussion long in advance of the of election day because you want obviously you have to play by the rules but you also want the rules to be applied in a consistent and um in a consistent fashion and in a fashion that is compliant with the actual words of the law um and so relationship is the, building is really important and jim can talk more about that but it's, it's critically important for you journalists to have a good relationship with your county election officials because some days they'll let you right into the polling place, and some days the, they'll say ten foot around the building, um, and it's different for every journalist, and it's so different in every county. I, so that's where that expression "I wouldn't touch that boat with a ten foot pole" would come from. Is that where it came from? Perhaps. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, yeah. I, can, so I can. If I could just jump in. Um, sure. I was going to say, Jim, you've got some practical life experience. Tell well, us about your reporters. And yeah, I mean, it, you know, you know, I, I absolutely right. What Melissa said that you know, if if you find if you've got a um, if you're a if you're a journalist or you're a, or a news manager and have crews that are out there trying to access polls and getting turned away in violation of that 10 foot rule, in other words, the 10 foot rule is being applied to the entire building or whatever, um, you know, notify your, your news director or your managing editor, and then we'll make phone calls. Um, and then sometimes we get Melissa involved, you know, um, uh, to make phone calls. Um, typically, if you can get a hold of whoever is in charge of of the elections office for that county, they'll know what the rule is and they'll be able to make calls to poll workers. I mean, poll workers are, you know, the, some of them um, are, are really not very uh, well educated on what, on what the law says, what the rules are. So we just need to help them. Uh, I experienced something this year that I've never experienced before. Ron DeSantis, Florida's governor, came to Pennsylvania to campaign for Doug Mastriano and as a news organization, in order to go inside and attend that, my crew would have had to sign, in order to get credentials, in order to RSVP, just to go inside, we would have had to sign a document that, that gave the DeSantis folks, or the people who actually were running this, and maybe you can talk a little bit about them, I would have had to sign away my rights to how I was going to use the video. If they wanted to get some of that, all of our raw video, I would have had to turn, I would have been agreeing to turn that over, which is just something we would never agree to. So we did, we covered it, but we did not go, we did not go inside. We used their Facebook feed in order to in order to cover that from what was going on inside, but it was very, very unsatisfying. Melissa? Yeah, and that that happened, I, I, I reviewed a, several journalists shared that um, Turning Point USA dis, uh, waiver or, or agreement with me before the events took place. And they, it wasn't just at that one event, it, they've used it at multiple events in Pennsylvania. So it's it's kind of like their standard practice. Um, and, and my advice to journalists was basically what Jim already did. Uh, in that case is we don't sign anything that would give a third party unfettered access to your content or any right to determine what you use and what you don't use. Um, the, the, it, it, it's something that no media organization would sign. Um, and it's, uh, it was almost laughable to read it. I'm like, I, it's uh, clearly no media organization would sign this. And it's almost like uh, the, you know, they don't want you to cover their event, but they're saying, well, if you agree to all these crazy things, maybe we'll let you in. Um, but no media organization would agree to those terms. So uh, I think some media organizations did work with the uh, Turning Point or Mastery or um, DeSantis campaign uh, to, to tweak some of those terms to make them more acceptable. Um, but all the, as written, the the agreement, the proposed, the proposal was outrageous from a from a legal perspective, from the press perspective. And in terms of, does it make any difference? Because I, I know I've seen some various reports over the last month or so as to whether the event is taking place in a public location as opposed to a quote private quote close quote location. It it does. There have been cases where these public events have been held at private locations, and there's an argument that the First Amendment applies. Um, but those cases really kind of go both ways. So uh, in the Midwest, I think Chicago area, there was a um, a political event held at a, a, a private location, but the court found that it was it, it was required to be open to the public and as well as as well as to press um, without content based restrictions. Um, but there have been other cases where the courts have decided the other way. So it's something to keep in mind. There's no clear First Amendment right of access 
to private property, even when a political campaign is using it for campaign events. But it's certainly something you can argue about, and you should. I mean, I, I wouldn't take no for an answer immediately. Um, and I do just want to mention that um, as far as journalists, you're all presumably eligible to vote. If you exercise your own right to vote, you can take, as a voter, you can take your own photograph inside the polling place. I mean, I know one of the cardinal rules of journalism is don't become the story, but if your only option is to use a, you know, to use your own selfie in the ballot box or to take a picture of your ballot as it's sitting there in front of you, that is an option for you. Um, sometimes, and Josh, talk, Josh and I talked about this before the, uh, the PowerPoint or before the, the webinar today, sometimes people will post their own ballot selfies to social media. The question is, can I use that? Um, Maybe it's always if you're going to pull something off of social media, uh, get permission to use it from the owner to, to avoid any kind of copyright or invasion of privacy issues. Um, but that's another avenue you can explore as well. And, and I wanted to get to this topic because the term itself just fascinates me, a ballot selfie. So someone taking a picture of themselves voting is basically what you're talking about. Correct. Correct. So, so you know, and, this, I was going to say in this day and age with most people vote Well, you know, I vote on a voting machine. So all you're going to mm -hmm. see is a bunch of lights. You know, I'm, I assume we're mostly talking about people that vote on a real ballot, like a paper ballot. I mean, I've, I've snapped pictures of myself with my kids inside the ballot box and I vote electronically and it, it does show up. I mean, I, I could see what was on this on my screen. Um, I don't think there's a problem in in publishing that it's, if, it's, if it's my own content. Right. You couldn't take a picture of some other voter. You know, but you couldn't peek inside the curtain and 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 you right. Know. That's why you were talking about taking it yourself. Or what if that voter gives you permission to do it to take a, a well, picture? If the well, if you, if the if the if you're inside the polling place, technically that ten foot barrier still applies, and you you shouldn't be taking pictures. I mean, if if you have permission from both the voter and the election officials who are working in that site, I don't see a problem with it. Um, uh, that's pretty rare though. Although, I mean, it practices, I've seen coverage from newspapers who are inside the polling place, getting people signing their name to the register before they go in. And I've seen folks like at my polling place who are 10 feet outside the building. It really varies widely. And it really is based on who in particular is running that polling place. So it's really good to work on those relationships. Okay, we have a couple minutes left. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Uh, I'm looking in the chat function. I don't see any, but if anybody's online, if you want to ask a question, you can unmute yourself. If you could just say who you are and what, what organization you're with, if you can. And if there aren't any questions, and I'm going to wait a couple of seconds here to see if anybody taps in. I have a question I want to ask in conclusion. Okay, the silence is deafening. Um, <laughs> I just had this question and it's a real, we have with the two minutes or so we have left. And I'd ask all three of you, Josh, Melissa and Jim, in, you know, in a couple seconds each. What do you think the, the motivation, I'll call it, behind this sort of, uh, you know, avoiding the, 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 the press, you know, the, the, the legitimate press, I'll call them, you know, by these candidates of being adopted and not doing debates. What do you think the motivation behind all of this is? Well, I'll go first. I think it's uh, I think it's different for Fetterman than it is for Mastriano. I think for Mastriano, it plays into his persona, his message, which is that you know we can't trust government, we can't trust the fourth estate, we can't trust the man, um, and, and so we're part of that. I mean, you know, the negatives for the media uh, have never been higher. Uh, I think, you know, President Trump uh, helped fuel that. Um, we're the enemy of the state, and that's his message. I think for Fetterman, I think it's different. I think for Fetterman, first of all, he was up by double digits. So if you're up by double digits, you know, why take a chance with doing a lot of interviews or a lot of debates? But now that it's close and he's still ducking debates, uh, I, I think it might be that he, you know, I, I have a feeling it might be because of his medical condition and he, he's, they're concerned about his, ready, his readiness for, um, you know, gloves off debate with Dr. Oz. That's, just, that's my take on it. Melissa? Yeah, I agree with everything Jim just said about the candidates. Um, I think aside from those two, I think there's always a really strong desire to control the message. Um, and 
journalists don't allow, don't allow you to do that. Um, so I think they're weighing their options. I think they can, I think some candidates who have this hesitancy to speak to the press believe they can get the message out just as well. They can do our job. Um, and I don't think that's actually gonna prove true for them. Um, I also think it's a bad strategic decision as well uh, because the press are the eyes and the ears of the public. You have to deal with them, like it or not. Um, we, we are the fourth estate and it's, it's, an, important, it's an important role in, in government function. And Josh, I'll give you the last uh, guess or opinion as to why. <laughs> I would just add that I, I think it's a societal trend, uh, especially with social media now, where uh, any, any opinion that you have, you can now find people all over the world to just reflect that opinion and, and say, yes, that is, that is correct. Um, and, and I view the news as something that uh, tries to bring people together, tries to find a, a consensus. It tries to give equal, equal reporting to both sides of an issue. And I, I, I feel like this avoiding the media is a, a sign that people are just going to cater to, can, political candidates are just gonna to cater to their base um, and they don't want to have any any uh, negative idea uh, put in or, or any 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 pushback on the ideas that they have. So I think and I think that's more more than just political candidates. I think that's a broader trend in society. OK, well, thanks, everyone. Um, Jim, Melissa, Josh, thank you very much. Thanks for everyone who participated by listening in this afternoon. Um, I'll close with this quote from George Carlin. If you don't vote, you lose the right to complain. So please, everybody, and, and to the journalists on the call, please uh, good luck and be safe in your reporting over the next month or so. It's going to get more interesting and not less. And uh, once again, to remind everybody, we will be sending copies of this along with the PowerPoint to everyone signed on by the end of the week. And if you have any questions in the meantime, there's contact information where you can email any of us to ask a question or move, pass something along. So with that, I'll say thank you and good afternoon. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Okay.